All right, we are about three minutes away from getting things started. Thank you to those of you who are patiently waiting. Feel free to check in in the chat. We could have a little, little talk before we get started. Just something to, uh, just something to pass the time. Two minutes and forty-five seconds until we get this thing started. All right, we've got a question from Johnny Felix on Twitch, and the question is, are you streaming on YouTube? The answer is yes. So if you're having any trouble with Twitch, uh, feel free to also try to hop over to the YouTube channel uh, to see if that stream works a little bit better, and vice versa. If you're having trouble on YouTube, hop over to Twitch. But uh, typically, the little five-minute intro time, the little wait time that we have up front on the stream is more so, more than anything else, with the little laptop we've got uh, to get the streaming software a second to breathe so it could... Uh, operate effectively but the good news is that uh in september i think we're going to be getting a new laptop the streaming is going to be a little bit better and i think with that we are going to introduce the fabled webcam that i have constantly talked about for the past year and teased a little bit but haven't actually gotten but uh thanks to some of you who are very generous and have signed up for the ht lifetime subscription we are going to be adding a uh, a new laptop a webcam and hopefully upgrade our stream game to make the production a little bit better than what we've got right here, which is just basically screen recording and me talking in the background. 30 seconds until we get things going. All right, that is the timer. I tried to run out and grab water for a second, and it looks like the clock just beat me. But we are back. And uh, welcome back to another weekly stock market scan, stream, screen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is Hourglass Trader, and thank you to all of you who have tuned in to join me tonight. Uh, feel free to use the chat if you have any questions as we go through this. Uh, any suggestions, any stocks you want to take a look at, feel free to throw them in there. And I'm actively reading it as we go. Uh, but yeah, let's recap what happened last week. I think it's been a couple weeks since we streamed. I was out of town last week, uh, but we've had a pretty good run here, right? Uh, two weeks to catch us up on here. Two weeks ago, the market dropped 1.16%. We still came away with the $54 profit. And I think the only thing I really want to talk about from two weeks ago is the little bed, bath and beyond you know, disaster, if you want to call it that. We had like a $2,300 bite taken out of our account overnight. So it would have been a much, much better week, but those types of things happen, right? Uh, things aren't always going to go the way you want, but what's important is that we have a backup plan. And I think if we flip over to this tab right here, what you'll see is that backup plan. So even though we had this cumulative loss of $2,300, what did we do? We closed those out right away because there was, they were in the money. Of, it was a volatile stock. When you're in the money on something like this, the extrinsic value you know, isn't as high as you would like it to be. So we rolled down. Uh, we slightly increased the position size, but we rolled these 12 puts down to 10 puts and then added 10 more contracts at 9.5. Uh, the 9.5 made us back 280 bucks. Uh, the 10 strike puts made us back 900. And while that didn't quite cover everything before, right, we were still at a $1,000 loss. Ultimately, last week, we sold nine strike puts for $1.12 a premium. 
And just like that, we made $1,300 off that. And even though Bed Bath & Beyond has had this insane drop on us in a two-week period, we've come out on top. Uh, so far, we have a profit of $234. We got to send Zoom in in the chat. Thank you. I can absolutely zoom in so we can look at this a little bit closer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hopefully, that's a... Uh, Hopefully that's a good zoom for you guys. But here's the idea, right? You know, it sucks that we had this thing move against us. But what we love about our option selling strategy is the fact that this isn't it. You know, that's not over. Just because something moves against us doesn't mean that the uh, that it's over. So what we do is we take what we've got. We had our break even price at 1056. We rolled the strikes down. We got a 1.12 uh, credit on that. We made 1300 bucks off and all of a sudden we've made $234. Uh, and this Bed Bath & Beyond trade, the premium is still just so, so, so good. So for the upcoming week, uh, we've got it right there. We've got an 8-strike put that we sold for $0.37, cents, which is hopefully going to bag us another $370. So even though Bed Bath & Beyond has dropped a ton on us, you add 370 to that number. That gets you up to $600 of profit on Bed Bath & Beyond just so, as long as it stays above an 8-strike. And again, we're comfortable going up to like 20, 30 contracts on this, and we only have 10 right now, so plenty of flexibility there as well. And flexibility is going to be the name of the game uh, as we move into the coming weeks, because I guess that was really the only thing I wanted to focus on two weeks ago. Let's talk a little bit about what happened last week. And for those of you who were following along, things were going okay. The market was maybe a little bit red, but at, at the final hour, you know, I, I mean, I say final hour figuratively, it was really most of Friday. Uh, the Fed made some statements that they were going to continue to stay on the path of the rate increases that they've currently been on, and the market didn't like that news. Excuse me. Uh, so as a result, the S&P 500 dropped 3.99%. However, we still made money. And because we still made a little bit of money with the big drop in the market, the metric that we like to really, really focus on right here are return versus the S&P 500. We crushed it last week as we outperformed the S&P 500 by 5.04%, uh, which I'm always going to be absolutely thrilled with. If we look at our performance since inception, uh, we're starting to run away a little bit. We've had a really, really good stretch over the last few weeks, few months. And even though we had this big dip back in April, I think we've recovered really, really nicely. We've played things a little bit more conservatively and adapted our strategies to the current market conditions. So what exactly did we do last week that allowed for that? The answer is, you know, we started with some smaller positions, right? Uh, DraftKings, you know, we typically had been holding 20 contracts of that if you keep going all the way back in time. Uh, however, we dropped it down to 10. And even though DraftKings ran into the low 20s at one point and seemingly got away from us, we stayed patient. You know, two weeks ago, I don't think we even had a position in DraftKings. Uh, yeah, we, we, we had a 17 strike put that we had. And then we took a week off because it ran above 20. But just be patient in the market because what goes up comes back down. And if it doesn't come back down, you know, don't sweat it. That's okay. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, we had that 17 strike put, which did move against us on the final day. So it went from being, you know, a couple hundred dollar gain to a little bit of a loss. But again, that $190 loss, that's not backbreaking, right? We had this Bed Bath & Beyond profit, which powered us through the week. Uh, we ran into a little bit of trouble with spreads, but we'll touch on that as we talk about next week. Uh, Fubo ran against us a bit on both the 4.5 and the 4 strike. But again, Open Door did the same thing slightly. We lost $20 on that position because we bought it back for one cent more than we sold it for. However, these are all smaller losses because they're smaller positions, quite frankly. And if we remember the overall strategy that we want to take on a week by week basis, uh, looking at what we've done throughout the year so far, I think is the best way to describe how we've decided to adapt the strategy, right? Because we'll remember in January, we had this huge drop in our account, and we, we threw away $38,000 in January, which is a tough number to look at. However, transparency is super important because it's not always going to be green. We're on a really nice win streak right now, and we definitely want to continue that. But it's important to talk about the losses, to talk about what we've learned from them and how we can avoid them in the future. Because it's one thing if you make a mistake in the market and you lose a bunch of money. Uh, you know, it's another thing if you make the same mistake over and over and over and just don't learn from those mistakes. So what was the big mistake in January? Uh, we took some super far out of the money positions. We used a ton of margin. Really, really bad idea. Really poor timing. Uh, but I'd rather learn from it early on now than five years from now have a much bigger account and then get crushed that way. April, what happened here? I don't think we made we did anything too terribly in April. We kind of got crushed by DraftKings, Fubo, you know, Affirm and Roblox, some of those other positions that really got hammered a little bit more than the market. 
Uh, but I think our strategy was better in April. It was just a tough, tough uh, month in the market. But moving forward, how did we combat that, right? We added some more bearish positions every time that we see a little bit of a jump in the market. Uh, and instead of being fully in on these positions as the market goes up, you know, we've started to scale in a position so that when the market goes down, we don't experience these big dips up front, right? We saw these big, big dips early on in the year. And yes, we would make some big money back on the bounces, but the idea here is that we scale in on the dips so that this number is smaller and we still have the big green number waiting for us on the other side. Man up, no excuses. What's going on, man? Welcome to the stream. Uh, but that's kind of what we've done so far. And yes, we're not going to have any of these eye-popping $15,000, $20,000 weeks. But again, the only reason we had those in the first place is because they were preceded by pretty large losses. We just want to avoid the large losses and slowly grind back up, which we've done, and avoided a lot of the recent volatility that the overall market is seen through the S&P 500 and NASDAQ indices that we use to benchmark ourselves over here. So this next week is going to be one of those scale-in weeks. And what's great is typically, you know, when the market drops 4% in a week, that's a massive number. Now, if we could go back to the last time that the market dropped 4% in a week, I mean, we got to scroll back a little bit this year. There's 6%, but yeah, last time the market dropped 5%, we did pretty well that week. That was back in June after we had adjusted the strategy. But if we go early in the year, right, we were leaking all this money when the market was dropping 1.8, you know, 0.26, 5.79, you know, that these aren't even that huge of a drop, you know, but you know, that is what we want to do adjust. And that is what we have adjusted, which is why we made money last week, even though the market dropped smaller positions, work your way into them. And what do we mean when we talk about scaling into different positions? Typically, we might have opened 20 contracts of DraftKings right off the bat. Typically, we may have opened 20 of open door right off the bat. And yes, we are currently holding 20 of open door. Uh, if you look two weeks ago, we started with 10 that turned into a losing position. And then we add some more. And I haven't completed the trade breakout tabs here to sh you know, fully demonstrate the impact of what scaling into a trade can do. But so far, a completed trade is a good example, right? We started small back in April with uh, 10 contracts. And even though it dropped 33% over the course of that trade, come July, even though we started with 10 and slowly scaled into 20, we got up to 40 at one point. But we walked away with a $1,100 profit again, despite that stock getting cut by about a third. And that break-even tracker is that conceptual device that we want to keep referring back to over and over again because we started playing SoFi for this example when it was at 935 and we exited it at 532 was our break-even price when we were done with that. And again, with it closing at 619, that's above the break-even price. That's why we made cash on the trade. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, similar idea, right? We had this 1179 break-even price and it was scary for a second here when it dropped down into the 10s, but rolling, you know, adding a few positions here uh, got us down a little bit. And then adding those nine strike puts got us to 882. And now we're in a position where if we add what we have for next week here, which is going to be the 10, where they go, where they go, where they go, the eight strike puts. Let's copy those in there and show you right now just to see the impact of this. One, we have a smaller position than before. Two, we're now going to be making $370. And if we drag this down here and then have equals max, eight minus the price of Bed Bath & Beyond, comma zero. There you go. That's gonna be our formula that we got right there. Uh, let me, okay, so now the, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the fact that if it goes down to 7.8, which would be an even bigger drop, right? A 66% drop, we're still making money. This is the active sell, the only active position that we have open in this series of trades. Uh, and if we go eight minus, we can go down to I think 7.8, maybe four ish. Look at that. If we get on a 7.4, we've made four bucks, which is like, okay, whatever, four bucks, but it's a 67% decrease of the stock. That is absolutely enormous. So what we can now take away is that as of last Friday, 26, our break even price is $7 and 40 cents, which represents a 67.83% reduction from the initial price that we entered Bed Bath and Beyond at. Now, a lot of that was on the initial one and Bed Bath and Beyond is a very, very volatile stock. But again, if it does go back down to 7.4, we could find another dollar of premium for next week and do the whole thing again with like a 6.4 break-even price. The idea is that we could drive these break-even prices down faster uh, than uh, the stock itself can drop. And if it does continue to drop, that's okay because with our strategy, we live to die another week. We're not going to die right off the bat with some of these. So let me update the 
formula right here to bring Bed Bath & Beyond back in, and that's our current situation, right? As long as it finishes above eight, we could have this big disaster where we had a decent position and the thing dropped 50% overnight. However, we're still making money. And that is the name of the game, and that is how we survive these tough markets. Another strategy that I do want to talk about, kind of in line with that Bed Bath & Beyond position we had last week, I've started to focus a little bit more on positions that are somewhat disconnected from the market. An example with that is Bed Bath & Beyond. It was the, I think it was the only, one of the only green stocks in the S&P 500 uh, last week, or last Friday, that is. But AMC is another good example of this, right? Why do I like these so much? It's because, one, these aren't really tied to the S&P 500. So if the market's crashing, people don't like what the Fed is saying, that's going to be just fine. And, you know, between these two positions, we made $1,600, right? We could have opened only these two and made pretty much the same amount of money. The rest of it was a wash, but we opened the rest because the rest work most of the time. So with that said, I like the idea of getting back into AMC, right? If we pop on over uh, to Thinkorswim, bring in AMC, we'll take a look. And again, uh, this is an important distinction that we have right here because one, uh, the little split that they had with their preferred APE dividend, uh, they pay out APE, which is ticker APE, and AMC. So you're getting 917 of AMC and whatever APE is trading for, which is like 6.5. So you add those two together, you're getting like 16 a share. So when you look at these strikes, you know, 16 is going to be considered kind of at the money right around here, as you can tell by where this is positioned. However, that math can be a little bit confusing. A lot of people don't want to look at two stocks at a time. So what's nice and easy is the fact that you can go to these new option chains right here and just trade these strictly AMC ones right now. So if you go to the nine strike, there's a ton of premium at the money on these. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend opening a nine strike because that's right at the money. Yes, it's a lot of premium, but these things could move really, really quickly. But what I really like to take advantage of here are, are these further out of the money strikes, right? With AMC, you could go over 10% out of the money here at an eight strike put. And if you look at an eight strike put and we go to the chart, if it pulls up for me here really quickly, come on chart. Come on, come on, come on. And we go out to like the 180 day chart. And there we go. It's, you know, we want to subtract six because this big red candle here is a result of that preferred dividend. So it's really more at the 15 ish level. Uh, but they formed a nice base around there. And we've got a great comment here from George in the YouTube chat. And he says, the problem with these is that there's no margin allowed. However, I don't necessarily view that as a problem because what do we know that we want when we search for a certain return on a week-to-week -week basis we know that we want at least a one percent return fully cash secured and if there's no margin on these that just means you have to sell them fully cash secured which is no problem because if you sell an eight strike put fully cash secured what are you getting right here you're getting even though you have to take the full amount of buying power which you know maybe takes away a little of the flexibility you're used to one it's going to make sure you don't go crazy with margin but two even if you sell this fully cash secured, you're still getting that 2.56% ROR, which on a weekly basis is a massive, massive number. So that's why I'm a decently large fan of these, especially when the market is a little bit turbulent. And again, the market maker move is only a dollar right here. That would put the low end of the expected move range at 817. The eight sits right below that. I'm a fan of potentially adding some AMC eight strike put. So we could you know, kind of start making our list over here for the upcoming week. Bullish, let's do A M. Oops, I typed the wrong letter. AMC 8P. There we go. And then uh, let's see what else we've got here. Bed, Bath & Beyond, we did the same exact strike, right? I mean, it's a slightly different trade if we go to BBBY. And there you go, right at the 8 strike put. But this is a 4, it's a 4.71% ROR, which is absolutely massive. Now, you could go further if you want that 2% RR down at the 6.5 strike, but I'd like to bite off a decent amount here because I'm a little bit more comfortable with the 8 strike, right? There's definitely some risk in Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, you know, it bottomed out at 5-ish. I think there's some serious bankruptcy risk, but again, it's one of those things. AMC and GameStop, before they shot up and had all this volatility, also had bankruptcy risk. Uh, and I think an eight is a decent-ish level to play it from, at least on a week-to-week -week basis, right? This can absolutely fall back down. We've seen it fall back down before, but it's not going to go to zero overnight, to be honest with you. We're just trying to race our break-even price to zero before the stock can get there and effectively put us 
in, in somewhat of a risk-free trade if we get our cost basis below zero overall. Uh, but yeah, with that said, that is why I like AMC. That's why I like Bed Bath & Beyond. And you might say, oh, you know, it's kind of weird that you're trading some of these meme stocks. I think a turbulent market like this is a great time for meme stocks because we could start to target some of these stocks that have been demonstrably disconnected from the market because we don't want to be connected to a market that looks like this. Uh, we could take a look at futures, right? They're already down 1.22%, meaning it's might gonna it's probably going to be a pretty bloody Monday morning. And let me reset the chat on the screen really quickly so that we're not completely staring at it. Which one is it? I'm guessing here. Perfect. On and off. So uh, with that said, let's talk about the elephant in the room, which are these SPX spreads that we're holding, which is probably going to be the biggest thing. It's going to take this from a green to a red number. Now, again, let's keep in mind the futures are down 1.23%. It can get better. It can get worse. But if our account dropped 1.23%, you know, we'd be down around like $2,000 on the week. So uh, with that said, we have a 4045 short leg on our SPX spreads. It's looking like we're going to open well below that. And this is kind of the one risk we run with our SPX strategy. Now we normally would like to close out if it breached the long leg, which it is absolutely breached at this point. And we like to expect a 2.8 closing price. However, I'll tell you right now, as it currently stands, we're not going to get that 2.8 closing price. So if we can get 3.5, I think that's a good number to close these out at. Yes, it sucks that we're going to take a $1,500 hit on these spreads. Uh, but what I propose from here is maybe not necessarily doubling down. I think we keep the same position size. Because what I would hate to have happen, and I, I love to double down, double down, double down with the call spreads, right? Because they're bearish and it, it, you know the market doesn't run up really, really quickly. We've seen from the big drops that we have, and let me pull up the spy chart to kind of demonstrate this a little bit better. There are enormous red candles that look like this. You see big red candles right here that uh, you know illustrate these really large drops that we've seen in the market. Now, when we see runs like the run that we had over the last few months, there really aren't enormous green candles, right? So it happens a little bit more slowly, but these drops can happen very, very quickly. And that is what we are working to avoid. Now, I think we're going to have a little bit of support here at the 4,000 level. So I'm okay with closing out for that kind of a loss. And then look, if, if we add a row here above, and let's say we take the exact same position size, minus six right here, and these are going to be different strikes, but we roll it down below four, we get a $1 credit, and then we come out of that alive because it just stops the bleeding. That's going to make us back $600, and that's going to flip our account into the green on the week. So I think preliminarily, I think that's the way to go, right? Uh, one trade is not going to win us the week, but I really am worried that if we double down again on these XPX spreads, yes, that is typically the strategy, uh, but I worry that one trade could ruin the week. Because if we do this with the double position size and take another $3,000 hit here, $4,500 of red on SPX at the beginning of the week is going to be tough to come back from. Now, if we have a net $900 loss on SPX at the beginning of the week, you know, we have some of these other trades pop in and off this big of a dip with this spike in implied volatility like this, I think Monday morning is going to be a very, very good buying opportunity for us. And what do I mean by that? Maybe we'll add some more of the FUBO. Maybe we'll add some more of the open door. But what I think I'm truly partial to is just adding some more different positions, right? We, we typically have these long lists of bullish positions. If I scroll back up to like a more normal like a more normal week for us, right? If we go back up here before the market started running, 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 but we have all these open door. We had CLF, Zim, MSOS, F. There's, there's tons of different tickers out there. And I think through the rest of this stream, we are going to try to identify some of those. And so far we've got AMC, which I think is going to be great to add to the mix. If we add 10 of those eight strike puts that we talked about, you know, that's 200 more dollars right there to bump this number up. And that's what we want to do. Just a bunch of base hits that we can add to this list of stocks and tickers that we have in our portfolio to run this number more and more positive. However, this is a hypothetical position. So right now we're going to put this at zero. We're going to highlight this. What's, well, what's the hypothetical color? I think it's like purple. So we're going to highlight that purple because it's a hypothetical position. But I think the move right there is to hope that come tomorrow morning, we can get out of these for 3.5, take a $1,500 loss. That's okay because even that $1,500 loss, you combine that with last week, that's still a net $300 profit on top, like, you know, in the face of a 5% drop. 
Again, our goal is to outperform the market. If we have to lose money one week, it happens, but we're coming off a you know streak of eight winning weeks in a row. What do we want to do? Goal A right now is to avoid the weeks like this back when we lost like 23K, 20, 14, 17K in a week. Those are the weeks that we want to avoid. Look, if we leak a couple thousand dollars this week, it happens, you know? And even with the quote unquote disaster that we have on our hands, there is as George referred to it in the chat right here, which I kind of want to put back on stream, on screen, uh, it's not maybe a disaster, but a big smelly pile of poop in the corner of these SPX spreads. And couldn't agree with you more. You know, sucks starting off Monday morning with a little bit of adversity to handle. But again, adversity is normal in the market because we're not just going to be asleep at the wheel here uh, having these green weeks roll in. And over this eight-week stretch, we've averaged $3,500 of profit a week. So, keep that number in mind as well. You know, we've averaged $3,500 of profit a week in a time where the market was still a little bit up and down, right? It wasn't, it's not a straight shot up for the S&P 500, despite the fact that our account has had a straight shot up recently. Now, we have a great question here in the Twitch chat uh, saying, why are we trading SPX instead of SPY? And there are a couple reasons with that. Uh, Since we're using spreads, one of the things that I like the most about SPX is is there's no assignment risk. It's cash settled, meaning that on your day of expiry at 4 p.m., the price is the price, and that is that. Uh, when you trade spreads with you know something like SPY, the stock, at 4 p.m., the trade isn't over. You're subject to a little bit of risk after hours for moves. So it's you know, you're on the fence a little bit right there, and you bring in pin risk on the spreads that you have there. Uh, another reason that I like SPX so much is that it's tax advantaged meaning it's treated as a, uh, I forgot what section asset it is, but there's a favorable split and you could treat more of it than normal as long-term capital gains. And there we've got George you know, chipping in in the YouTube chat to back me up a little bit. But yeah, cash settled is great. No risk of assignment is great. And the other thing that I like here is that the denomination is larger, right? SPX is at like 4,000, where SPY down here is at like 400. So if you're trading and you know targeting 300 400 gains like we are on each spread you need to trade fewer contracts and again fewer contracts means fewer commissions paid by a multiple of 10. so those are the reasons why i like spx and i think it's great for this spread strategy that we run and we've had a lot of success with it so far right if you were a little bit behind here and we're still behind on some profitable ones right the last one we have in here was 817. we've had some winners before then but again since the beginning of May, the strategy has run up about $9,000 in profit. Uh, with a really, really nice win rate, we've only had to triple down a couple times. And yes, it gets a little scary, and we can deviate sometimes from the whole double, triple down as discussed here. But in general, we have a really, really high winning rate on these. I think the math that we, let me let me pop back to this tab really quickly, but the math that we've demonstrated here uh, with the expected value, uh, a positive expected value is, has been really playing it out very, very nicely for us. And again, this math that we have calculate, calculated right here is only based off a 67.5% chance of victory per spread. And so far in practice, since May, we've had a 70% uh, win rate right there. So if we bump this number down to like 30%, our expected value right here goes from $68 per two excuse me, I guess this is times three because we have a three size, but our expected value goes from $22 because this is the number divided by three. Uh, but again, our expected value goes from $22 per spread up to 36, which is a you know 50% increase in that if we do continue that 70% win rate. So the math is heavily in our favor on this one. Uh, and that's why I'm a huge fan of the strategy. We're going to continue to run this thing. It's been very successful for us and our spreads overall year to date have been profitable. We've made over $10,000 on spreads this year. But with that said, yes, I love a systematic approach to these spreads. The systematic approach to these spreads has treated us very, very well. Uh, However, I think in the context of a week-to-week basis and just trying to have an overall successful portfolio, since these are bullish, the rest of our portfolio is bullish, I don't want to like double and triple down on a larger bullish play, which risks a larger loss if things continue to move against us. I think we keep the same position size here. Again, try to go for that $1 credit at a strike below 4,000. This will be updated. And it might be easier if I just type in TBD to illustrate that. Uh, But again, that would net out to a $900 loss, which yes, that sucks. We never want to lose 900 bucks, but losing small amounts like 900. And again, this is all relative to your portfolio size, but losing amounts like 900 
are merely bumps in the road when you run enough of these trades to make back that $900 loss very, very quickly, right? You could win that back in three spreads, which we've done very, very often before. And we haven't really had a loser since the beginning of August. So we've, you know, almost made it an entire month without losing, but that's all right. You know, that kind of stuff happens. It's a reality of trading in the market, but that's our plan right there. And that should flip us back to the green. Uh, but I think being a little bit more transparent here, saying that this is the market's down as well. Some of these stocks are going to be down as well. So some of these numbers are going to be lower. So I think we're going to open with this number red. However, Let's talk about some of these bullish trades that we could enter into. We've got AMC H strike put. That's going to add potentially a couple hundred bucks for us right there. Uh, some of the other tickers that we like to look at, like Affirm. Affirm was down 21.33% last week. And let me pull the chat off the screen again really quickly so we could look at some of these charts. Let's take a look at the Affirm chart. Why is it not typing in Affirm? I didn't click on it. There we go. Let's take a look at the Affirm chart right here again. Closed Friday at 24.57. Went down about 10 cents after hours, but again, a big, big red Friday. So another question really quickly, how much are we putting at risk on those spreads? And what is the max gain on the spread? Uh, typically per spread, we like to go $1 on a $5 wise spread, meaning that it's a $100 max gain and a $400 max loss. However, rule number one with spreads, as demonstrated, is never take max loss on a spread. So typically when the strikes that we have get breached, We'll close out for a roughly four or $500 loss and then double our position size to make that back so that we could really mess up one time and still uh, turn a profit overall in the position. So let me take that chat back off the screen for real this time uh, and take a look at a firm, right? RSI is down in the blue on a 180 day basis. We love when RSI gets into the blue, but over the last 180 days, I think this does a decent job illustrating the price action that we've seen on the stock. Now, those of you who have followed us, and I've entered into uh, some of the trades that we've been entering into. You are very, very familiar with this one. And familiarity breeds confidence and gives you some idea of where things are going to stop. Now, in the last 100, excuse me, the last 20 days, the last trading month, it hasn't been this low. But again, from that 180-day chart, we know that it's been lower. So let's zoom in on kind of the lower parts right here. So where do we think we could potentially bounce from? And right off the bat, I think this sticks out like a sore thumb. So let me remove all the old drawings See ya, old drawings. And let's extend this new idea of a level of support to the left. And why do we identify this as a level of support? The answer, back in May, this is bouncing off this level. Uh, let's see, back at the end of June, it bounces off this level as resistance. It showed resistance again at the beginning of July. Finally broke through there and retested that level, bounced off it as support. So there you go. And that was at the end of July. So I really like the idea. This line is drawn at $23.49. So basically $23.50. I love the idea of potentially starting something at $23.50 here because it looks like the next levels of support, you know, are roughly 20 ish dollars a share. And let's talk a little bit here about the idea of scaling into a trade. Again, we we love getting about three ish percent ROR on these trades that we scale into, and we could absolutely accomplish that not just at the 23.5 strike, but maybe even lower at the 23 strike. And when volatility is high like this, we definitely want to take advantage of it by selling further out of the money if we can. And we absolutely can right here. So I think starting out with three or maybe five rather of the affirmed 23 strike puts, because again, a full position size that we're happy with on that one is about 15 contracts. Uh, but what's the idea right here, right? If we, we sell the Affirm, hold on. Affirm the 23 strike puts. And if we sell those for about like 0.78, let's actually bring some of these into the table because I know that we're going to be opening them. And it might be a little bit easier to illustrate this if we keep these highlighted purple and just demonstrate how much potential profit we can add uh, to help move some of this profit along next week, right? So if we start with just five of the Affirm, 9223p and those puppies are going for 78 cents a pop again that's a one-third size position that's 390 dollars a profit just right there off of that one and again if we have that those 10 amc 928 strike puts in there as well and we could snag 21 cents of premium on those there you go it's another 210 dollars a profit but this should start to illustrate the idea that we're going for right here right uh, the idea that, yes, it sucks, there's a $1,500 loss that we're probably going to be staring in the face tomorrow morning. But in that loss breeds some opportunity to add some of these, right? So between the three of these, we could basically make back $1,200 right off the bat with the potential profit that we're bringing in right here. 
And then the great part about these Affirm 23 strike puts, again, is that we receive a 78 cent credit as of the end of the day on Friday, which I expect to see a similar credit Monday morning. But we know that that would make our break-even price 22, uh, 22. So $22 and 22 cents. I did not just stutter right there, even though sometimes I do stutter on these streams when it gets a little bit later. Uh, but let's go to the 20-day chart right there, and we're going to know that 22.22 is our new break-even price, as highlighted roughly right about there. Let's extend that thing to the left and go look at the five-day. So we've got a little bit of cushion. Excuse me. Oh, wait. That's our level of support right there at 23.50, and then there is our break-even price. So over the next five days, one, we expect it to bounce off of this level, but two, so long as it stays above this red line right here, we're going to make money. We won't even have to think twice about this. But if it does drop to 22, 22, God forbid, what's our plan? You always want to have a plan for when things go wrong. So the answer is that if it does hit 20, 22, 22, 22, there we go. I told you I'd mess up talking. But if it does hit 22, 22, our break even price, then we add five more and potentially get 78 cents more of premium to lower our break even price by another 78 cents to maybe get that break even price down to 21.5. Uh, in this neighborhood down here. So even if it does breach this, yes, we could just move the goalpost, get it down here. And if it keeps dropping below there and hits that 20 level, that's all right, because we just get a bunch of shares at like a 22 cost. Uh, we sell some covered calls for the next week and keep moving our break-even price lower and lower and lower. So so that's the idea right there. And it's worked very, very well recently, especially with a firm. And I could scroll up here to maybe illustrate this with some actual examples of when we had to do this. And here's a great example, right? Very, very similar strikes, actually. So it's funny that we bring this up at this price level. Uh, but back at the mid-July, right? We had 22 strike puts. They went in the money. So what did we do? We added 20 strike puts. And even though the max profit on these was about $400-ish at the beginning of the week, by adding even more at $0.85, cents, not only did we lower our break-even price, but when a firm bounced by the end of the week, we went from initially having like a 400 ish break-even price to now getting 385 off the first leg and 425 off the second leg to getting... $810 of total profit there. So I guess the similarity to what we have this week is, yes, we have this $309, $390 max profit, but if it dips, then we add even more and then it starts to rebound as things typically do when RSI gets uh, this far into the blue. And what I mean by that, if we go to the 180-day chart, this far into the blue, right? Typically when it gets in the blue, we see some bounces. Into the blue, we see at least some choppy price action. And again, we don't need this thing to take off. That's the beauty of the option selling strategy that we were running right now. We just need it to trade relatively flat or slightly red and we're going to make money. But again, big sell off right here. It gets into the blue within what, two weeks, it's already back above this price level. So that's why we love that intersection of oversold RSI and high premiums because it gives us some really, really nice entry opportunities on some stocks. So we're going to hit the scanner in a minute to actually specifically identify some of those opportunities outside of what we just have on our watch list. But again, I think a great starting point, AMC 8 strike puts for 21 cents a premium, Affirm 23 strike puts for 78 cents a premium. And right there, you've got $600 of potential max profit in the bag for next week with a decent cushion, which is going to help you. And again, that cushion is so, so, so important because that's going to help you navigate a really tricky market, right? Affirm. Well, let's just throw this on here to demonstrate what that cushion looks like. Our break-even price is going to be that 23 strike minus the 0.78 of premium that we got, giving us a 22, 22 break-even price. The current stock price at the end of the day was 24.57, meaning that Affirm, as long as it doesn't drop 9.56% next week, we're going to make money on it with this position that we talked about. So Affirm could have a terrible week. It could drop 8%. Guess what? We're still going to make money on it. And that is how you navigate these volatile, difficult markets, right? That's how when the market you know, went into turmoil on Friday and dropped 4% on the week, that's how we still walked away with the profit. And that's how we're going to try to navigate. Even though we do have this bullish position that we know is going to get crushed, it sucks. We know it's going to get crushed. Uh, but again, 9.30 in the morning tomorrow is a long way away. It could bounce and we may not even have to worry about this. That would be crazy if something like that happened. Uh, we got a question here, very important question actually here. Uh, from Man Up No Excuses, why do we highlight those short puts in red on our sheet? So we've got the purple highlights right here to illustrate the fact that these are hypothetical trades, right, that we're discussing right now. Everything that we have in yellow listed in our portfolio right here, and I guess this is going to be the week of 828, a little live update. Uh, but everything we have in purple right here is hypothetical. So we don't actually have this position yet, but we've identified it as a good idea. Let's use the format painter to turn this red and just call these hypothetical. 
Hypothetic. Come on, come on, get it. Fn, F2, there we go. Hypothetical. We do not actually hold these positions yet. And we have, a, we have a comment saying a firm can do minus 9% in 15 minutes. And I totally agree with you. It can absolutely happen, which is why we're getting these big payouts. Uh, but again, it's also just as likely to do plus 10% in 15 minutes as well. Volatility works both ways. And we've definitely seen volatility work both ways in the last like 100 days on this thing as it's gone all over the place. When it runs too high, we let it breathe. But when it comes back down, we swoop in on the, uh, on the big dips and get back in with some favorable break-even prices. And that's how we're going to continue to play a firm. Uh, so moving down the list, another one that we've had in prior weeks that uh, might be a decent idea to take a look at is SoFi. And SoFi closed last Friday at 618. I'm not sure there's actually going to be decent premium on this. I'd love to get something in the 20 cent range. Uh, let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. 15-ish cents, honestly, I really don't hate that number. If we could get like 15, 16-ish cents right there, I think that's a great entry. It's been relatively steady uh, in this low five and then seven plus range. So definitely a lot of upside here. I don't think it's going to get back to double digits anytime soon, but I do like the idea of initiating ourselves. Again, we know that a 10 si like you know, we, we don't want to put the entire position in there. With a firm, we could enter 10 more contracts on a firm and be fine. But again, maybe with SoFi, we just start nice and easy. We start with 10 contracts. We have SoFi, 9-2, six strike puts. These things are going for 17 cents. And uh, that's another little base hit that we're going to enter into right there for $170 of potential profit. And just like that, our little hypothetical thing that we've got going on right here is $1,370 of potential profit. We've got a comment saying SoFi is student loan debt. They are a financial institution, so they do have a hand in some student loans as well, but they do mortgages. They do some, I think, personal banking maybe. But uh, yeah, they, they are definitely in that space. However, I think, you know, the big hits on SoFi uh, came, I think, right around here. I forgot when exactly that initial student loan info came out, but that guy hit pretty hard. But I think it's relatively factored into the price of the stock now. Uh, regardless, if you look at a more short-term timeline, which is important because we're going to be trading this on a week-to-week -week basis, really, really nice base forming at this six-ish level. It's fallen off a cliff on last Friday. Uh, which is not a big problem for us at all because, again, we remember that when we sell a six-strike put for $0.17 cents a premium, that gives us a 583 break-even price, which is right around here. So as long as SoFi stays above this red line right here, we're going to be making money, and I think that's a very, very good value proposition to be looking at. Uh, so there you go. Let's look a little bit more at the watch list, see what we can see. Palantir's falling down, but the premium there, I think, spoiler alert, kind of sucks. Roblox is still relatively elevated. I'd like to see that one get back down into the mid-30s. Uh, what else have we got right here? Mm -hmm -hmm. Zillow is an interesting spot. Zim, I do like Zim because this one is a little bit disconnected from the market. And I think it's a solid stock. So if we go to Zim and take a look at the option chain that we've got right there, uh, we're going to see some really, really decent ROR here. We can go down to maybe 39 strike, which is okay-ish. We, we saw a big drop right here. And again, there was a big drop. Don't let this big drop alarm you. They paid out a dividend of 475, meaning that's going to be a 475 haircut to the stock price. Uh, so that's not a huge deal for me. Over the last 180 days, it's run way, way higher. Uh, but I think they had decent earnings recently roughly in line with estimates maybe slightly below but they had a red candle that was quickly recovered however uh 40 ish is a decent level and again they paid a 475 dividend so we do want to keep that in mind so really an equivalent price is like 45 when you look at this chart historically so there's maybe four or five ish more of tangible downside from here to the 37 38 level and we can't quite get one percent there which is a little bit surprising to me because this is a stock with a higher beta, meaning as the market moves, it typically outpaces the move, uh, whatever direction that may be in. Uh, we do have a comment asking us to take a look at Palantir. So let's go take a look at Palantir. I don't love the premium on Zim, so I'm going to stay away from it. Uh, 7.5 is offering 1.28%, which will get you a 740 break-even price. But I mean, that's that's not terrible. That 740 potential break-even price, especially with it staying at uh, at 740. And to be honest, to answer that question that we're getting about the uh, the SoFi loans and how the government plan works, I'm honestly not entirely sure about how the loan forgiveness works, but I do believe the money comes from the government and would pay the lender, which would be SoFi in this case. 
Uh, so defaulting the the people who are you know involved in that program aren't necessarily going to be defaulting on these, but uh, rather getting money from the government in lieu of being paid by the lender, or excuse me, the lendee. Uh, what else do we have going on the the uh, watch list right here? AMD back in the '90s. I don't still maybe a little bit elevated for me. Uh, bear with me for a second. I'm gonna look at what I'm familiar with before we head over to the option scanner. I mean, Robinhood's a little bit interesting just because that one typically has a lot of premium, and I think they've gotten smacked down pretty hard recently. Uh, you know, downside is 671 in the last 180 days. I'm not a huge fan of that, and we can, yeah, I mean, not a ton of premium there as well. Let's go to the scanner and see what we could see. Uh, so let's kind of run through the process here, right? We want to add our personal scanner, the high ROR puts without earnings. And we're just going to run that basic one. It excludes futures. This is just going to objectively show us the highest returns in the market as of market close on Friday for weekly options. And you may have noticed on our personal scanner, we've got tons of different options here. And you could load these into your very own ThinkorSwim module so you could scan with the exact same scanners that we're using. Uh, if you sign up for HD Premium at hourglass-trader.com, that's going to give you access to alerts to our trades as we make them live. Uh, along with a bunch of other trading tools such as these scanners and that is going to be the end of the self promo so thank you for bearing with me for those 10 seconds uh, but bed bath and beyond right at the top of the list big fan of that one we already talked about being in on that trade phase uh this one was a former spac meaning one of those companies that traded at ten dollars forever and underwent a reverse merger uh you know long story short on this one you don't want to touch this at 16.5 because Sooner or later, this thing is going to be under 10 a share. Couldn't tell you when exactly it's going to be happening, but uh, you could definitely tell from how expensive these options are. People are expecting it to be pretty soon, right? There's not, I mean, there's pennies of, you know, premium on the upside, but on the downside, especially if you look a little bit further out, like in September, yeah, you could get some decent premium pretty far out of the money. And honestly, not as much as I would have thought. I, I, I would have thought there'd be more premium on these especially because this has followed like the typical SPAC pattern where they have their merger shoots up to 21. You know, look at something like IRNT, where if we go to, uh, you know, the one-year chart. Oh, we've got to go a little further out now. I guess it's been a while. But you have this stock that trades at $10 forever, undergo the reverse merger. There aren't a ton of shares available because the stock sucks and people redeem their shares to just say, hey, I'd rather take 10 bucks a share. That's kind of the quick and dirty on that. But it squeezes up to 47.5, runs all the way back to 212. AKLI was one where that happened very, very recently. And this is a three-year candle, so that's probably not going to illustrate exactly what we want to go for. But again, squeezes up to 53. It's crazy, it's crazy. And then by the end of the day, uh, on August the 22nd, this thing was trading at $7, and by the end of the week, it was down to four nineteen. So those are some crazy stocks to watch, and they breed a lot of option premium, which you are probably going to see right here in the option chain. You might say, hey, 23% ROR, interesting number. Uh, I'm of the opinion these are kind of garbage stocks. We've gotten burned on them before, so again, you never want to make the same mistake twice in the market if you can avoid it. So I stay away from these former SPACs when they've run up super, super high. Uh, but with that said, I wonder if FaZe has a slightly different equity structure on there. So I'll have to look into that because typically after these things run up, they dump pretty quickly and it ran up already. You haven't seen a huge dump like we saw or a huge squeeze rather like we saw with AKLI where it went up to like 50 or IRNT when it went to like 47. So maybe we're going to wait one minute here and see if this runs any higher. But I really like the idea of potentially buying, God forbid that I say that, some longer term puts. But again, you, you could see this is kind of priced in, right? If you wanted to buy a 10 strike put, that's going for four bucks. So it would have to get below six for you to make money. And I don't want to necessarily guess when this thing is going to dump. But again, interestingly enough, October, you can get $2 for the 10 strike puts. So if it gets down to six before then, you, know, you could be making a decent amount of money. Uh, but yeah, we've got we've got uh, some great comments in the Twitch chat about some of the numbers, right? They've they've got a 1.22 billion dollar market cap, which is absolutely insane, uh, with very little revenue, terrible profit margin, not a lot of cash. This is one of those classic SPAC disasters, and I think it's only going to be a matter of time. Uh, another great question from Man Up No Excuses in the Twitch chat: What about a call spread on the SPACs? Right, it might be a little safer if we take the bearish route uh, through something not as crazy as like a put with all this juiced up premium. Uh, but with like a call credit spread, and interestingly enough, what you'll see with these is that when the puts have big premium like this, we could use the October chain, for example, where like 
the 7.5 strike put, which is over 50% out of the money, has like a 15.8% ROR. That bearish action is typically going to be kind of priced into these spreads, right? So if we wanted to sell like a 15, 20 call spread, uh, you're getting like a 25% ROR, which honestly is not bad at all. However, the only thing that I'm a little bit wary of is the fact that the the bid ask spread on this is like 25 and a buck 30 because it's after hours. So this might not entirely represent what you can get filled at, but if you can get filled at like a decent price on that, I don't think it's a horrible idea. Uh, the only trouble you could potentially run into is the fact that uh, it squeezes up and then your short leg gets assigned and then you have a short position. That's the risk right there. So to potentially bypass that risk, what I propose on these SPACs at least is instead of a call credit spread where you have that early assignment risk, enter into a put debit spread uh, where early assignment is a feature, meaning you make max profit, right? So we turn this from a sell into a buy. Uh, you know, that's a little bit more what I would expect, right? Your max loss is 43.50, which is a big number. Max profit 650, which, you know, for an October expiry, I think that's a pretty long time to wait. Uh, and your break even price has to finish below 1565. So you need a little bit of a move in your favor with this example. Uh, but with that said, you know, I don't think it's a great value either way. I think if you really, if we did a little bit more research offline, not live on this stream, I'm not going to subject you to the boring research I do sometimes, but you know, figure out when the share unlock on this is, meaning the date that the people who got in super, super low on this can unload their shares. That might be a good day to jump in on this. We love the SPAC share unlocks, like the pipe unlock. I don't know if there was a pipe mechanism on this uh, merger, but remember, we've got, a, we've got a good blog up on our website about that. It's called Getting Piped, I think. Uh, but you could take a look at that to see how a lot of these SPAC mergers work and why there's typically a really, really big, uh, what should I call it? dip at a certain point in time and i think spir is a great example of that and we learned about this because we got burned on this one but again never make the same mistake twice learn from the mistake and uh know how to put it into action in the future right but again this was one another very very typical spac if we go back to the three-year chart trades at 10 forever squeezes up to 19.5 and all of a sudden they have their share unlock and it goes from 1402 to 6.91 in a day and over the next two months, just bleeds out and is now trading at $1.47 per share. And this is very, very common, right? SPIR, RMO is another. Trading under a dollar a share. Just remember this shape uh, when you see SPACs. Uh, another good comment, debit spreads. You want low IV when you enter. And typically on spreads, if your short and long leg are, to get, are you know decently close together, and this applies for both credit spreads and debit spreads, you know, implied volatility really isn't that large of a consideration for me when I enter into these spreads. In fact, I almost prefer spreads in a lower IV environment, period, uh, just because they offer a little bit more value as opposed to selling cash secured puts uh, when, invi when implied volatility is low, but we haven't seen an environment like that in a while. Uh, but reason being is, yes, if there's a big surge in implied volatility, uh, your short leg is going to be worth more money. But if you sell the strikes that are reasonably close together, the long leg that you buy to hedge it and create the spread, that's also going to be worth a little bit more money. So you're not really gaining any value from an increase in implied volatility. The only thing that you know you're really risking is a big move in the stock one way or the other, uh, which is you know makes your spread a little bit more stressful. So I honestly prefer spreads, you know, either credit or debit, in lower volatility environments. But I, I think they're a very useful tool for shorting the market sometimes, as as we. Uh, as we did a couple weeks ago, when you scroll up here and we just had this laundry list of credit spreads uh, that we somehow still made money on, which is why we love the cushion on, uh, which is why we love the cushion in the market so much. Uh, but again, back to current week, we've got these three trades right here, the hypotheticals highlighted uh, that are going to bring in, you know, $1,370 of potential profit to help mitigate some of the losses that we anticipate taking tomorrow morning. But let's find some more names to put on there, right? We've we've got the objective highest premium in the market right here on the screen. Oh, uh, and there's AMC. And the case with a lot of these is going to be that these are terrible trades. And we we talk about that a little bit in our option scanning YouTube videos. Not everything on here is a good trade. What we talked about earlier that we really like to do is kind of bottom fish some of these, right? We we love to look at different technical metrics. One of our favorites is RSI. And we we talked about earlier how we loved affirm so much because uh, volatility is high, you know, and, and it's not as high as it was two weeks ago because they just reported earnings, which is going to drop it a little bit. Uh, but it's relatively high. And if we go to the 180 day chart, we're going to see that RSI is low. 
So how can we find this intersection of high IV and low RSI? I think this is kind of like the money combination. So we go to the scan here and to filter down, right, we have 832 different results. So if we go to the intersect with feature, we go to personal and we go to oversold stocks. That is going to find us a much more focused list of stocks that have really, really high premiums and are also, you know, they've fallen down a ton recently. MMM, top of the list. Let's take a look at what that is. No idea what this is. You're learning with me. 3M, they just had a massive dip. Why did they have a huge dip? Let's take a look because that is enormous. Implied volatility is at like a 180-day high. That is huge. Uh, and RSI is down at 19, which is about as low as I've ever seen it. So with 3M, uh, let's see what we got right here. Is denied bankruptcy shield uh, against mass earplug claims. Interesting. Uh, let's see. So they have a bunch of lawsuits against them that they cannot uh, use bankruptcy to protect themselves against. That is very interesting. It does not look like things are going very well for them. Uh, but, you know, 125 is like the low here. This is kind of like the devil on my shoulder talking through the process right here. Uh, I really don't know a ton about 3M bankruptcy. It's not something that's been talked about a ton. We go to the three-year chart even. And this level right here looks phenomenal on a three-year basis. Let's finish out the exercise and just take a peek and see what we could see for the uh, for the options right here. Keeping in mind that on this 180-day chart that we look at, 125 is the low, so that could be a decent level to sell these things at. Uh, 125, I mean, there's a lot. Oh my gosh, there is a lot of premium on these things, man. Uh, but we do see that the regular expected move from these is $10.22. We see that the market maker move is 9.88. Uh, that would suggest that $120 is gonna be the low end of the range here. And I don't hate the idea of selling a 120 strike. Now the issue here, uh, what I foresee to be the issue is if we you know, drop this all the way down to the lowest denominator with one very low uh, margin requirement, right? It's a $12,000 fully cash secure, but it's only 1600, meaning it's a 10% return on our capital. Uh, but uh, with that said, you get a pretty low break even price. However, in order to jump in on one of these, I would need to be much, much more familiar with what's going on with some of their bankruptcy proceedings. Their earplug unit looks like it's what's going to bankruptcy. I don't really know how much of their business that constitutes. Sometimes if you look at 3M, there you go. You get a little company profile here that I could try to pull onto the screen really quickly. I don't. Healthcare looks like it's 30.2% of their company. So if you slash 30% off the stock price here, you know, that gets you below 100. I mean, that would imply that they do literally nothing else in healthcare. Uh, but if we could take a look at healthcare... And this may be worth some research that I'll post in the Discord later if I'm able to take a look. But just figuring out what value of their stock is attributable to the earplug unit because that's what the bankruptcy issue looks like. And typically what you'll see, uh, you know, when you see these big initial dips on potential bankruptcy news is that, look, if uh, they have this rumor, and new, not rumor, I guess, but news about potential bankruptcy for their earplug unit, this big drop in the price is kind of pricing in trouble on the earplug unit. So yes, you don't really want to get in on the first candle, but you know, after the dust is cleared a little bit and after, you know, it's dropped back down here and hit this 125 ish level below where we saw some support, it may not be a, uh, it may not be a terrible idea. I just, I really just need to get a little more comfortable about what's going on with their earplug unit. Because I don't know the answer to that. No, XPEV is the next one that we see on this list. But again, this is an example of how this scan is super useful to find some opportunities like this. Uh, this looks like it's an Asian stock, which scares me a little bit. Let's learn about it right here. It is headquartered in Guangdong, China. And they are a elect Chinese electric vehicle company. So if we back it up, go to the 180-day chart, I think I know what I'm going to see because it showed up on this scan. There you go. RSI is really, really low. Implied volatility, not terribly high, but the options carry good premium, which is why it's on this list. IV rank actually and IV percentile, you know, comparatively low to where they've been previously in the year. So I don't think maybe this is the greatest 
from an IV perspective. However, it looks like it bounced twice around this 1918 ish level. It's right at that 1918 ish level again. RSI is a little bit lower. What can we see in the option chain? It looks like you can get maybe 2.13% on an 18 strike put. That would throw you at like a 17.65 break even price. I mean, not terrible, this number right here. However, I just, I, I really try to stay away from the Chinese stocks. They admittedly scare me a little bit. Uh, just because, of, you know, these big drops that you see just like this. However, it looks like it started trading at like August 2020. So, you know, this level isn't terrible. Maybe if you want to get a little dicey, but like I just I just don't know if it's really worth the risk, right? If we were to sell like five of these, I mean, if sell five of the 18 strike puts, we're getting 150 bucks for like a you know, nine thousand dollar position in a Chinese vehicle company. Yes, that's like five percent of our overall thing, but overall portfolio that is. I just it's one of those risks that I don't know if it's necessary to take. So I agree with that. You know, we've got a comment saying I don't trade China after what happened with Luck and Coffee. I totally agree with that sentiment. Just a lot of risk that I don't think is necessary to take with what's going on in China. So let's go back to the scan, see what's next. A bunch of these 3M Sonos. Remember we had Sonos come up a couple of weeks ago because they tanked on earnings and showed up on one of our alerts. Uh, it looks like a lot. You know, first off, let's talk about general trends in the stock market. We've seen a lot of these stocks run up and then come back down to their pre-COVID highs. Pre-COVID highs for Sonos uh, are right at 1550-ish, and the stock is at 1531. I think this is a phenomenal level for entry, and they have weekly options. I love to see that as well. Uh, basically, dead on the money, they've they've got like 1.97 percent ROR. I love that as well. Uh, we could maybe even potentially initiate a larger position at a 14.5 strike, but either way, this this is a decent looking entry on this stock. Now, I'm very very partial to scaling in, right? Because Here's the deal. Here's why I love scaling into positions. We could either take a full position at 14.5, uh, where we would take $14,000-ish of assignment if we sold 10 contracts. And that would bring in, if we sold 10 contracts, about $130, $140 for that position. But if we sold five contracts, just half of that, and scaled into a full 10, we could sell five of these, which go for about 27-ish cents a piece, which puts you just south of $150 of profit, which again, that's exactly how much the full position at 14.5 was going to get you. You could get $150 of profit by selling five here or 10 here. Five here is much safer uh, than selling 10 here because if it drops lower, we could sell five more and get potentially even more profit if it does bounce like we illustrated with the firm a little bit earlier in the stream. Uh, but I like going, you know, even though it's slightly closer to the money, right? Uh, we see a market maker move here of 41 cents, which puts the low end of the range at 14.90. We sell five of these puppies. That's going to put us at 1475 break even price. And I think that 1475 break even price, if we go to the five day, is a really, really nice number to be in on, right? If, as long as it stays above this line right here, we're going to make money on Sonos. Uh, RSI is definitely looking oversold on the one year. Implied volatility, not as high, but what we could see is that we still get some decent premiums, right? 1.97% ROR, which again, if we cut that in half, would give us the equivalent of roughly a 1% ROR on a full size position. So I love the idea of selling five of these for about 27 ish cents. So let's add to the hypothetical list that we've got right here. Let's go negative five, so no, nine, two, 15 P for about, you know, we'll split the difference on the bid and the ask there and call that 27 cents. And again, that adds $135 to the list here. And all of a sudden, even though we're potentially going to take this $1,500 loss on SPX, we're already still looking at four figures of profit thanks to what we've added right here. And again, uh, we have room to add 10 more of DraftKings. We could add 20 more of Open Door. We could add 20 more of Fubo. We could add 10 more of Bed Bath & Beyond. I also plan to add to these as well, right? So if we added 10 more of DraftKings, and again, I keep saying and again, so hopefully I'm not just talking you're off here. The way that we want to manage these positions is we know that DraftKings, we're going to make money as long as it's above 1585. If it stays above 1585, I'm not touching it because I'll take my money. Now, if it does get down below 1585, we'll add 10 more DraftKings. That could add about, you know, anywhere between three and four hundred more dollars of profit to the pool here. And I think that is uh, how we're also going to continue to build some of this profit and try to keep ourselves relatively around break even or get back into the profitable category again. Uh, for next week 
And point being, there's still a lot of a lot of time between now and uh, what should I call it? Tomorrow morning at 9:30 a.m. when the market opens, this could also rebound by the time we've woken up, and this could potentially hit max profit. Now, this is very wishful thinking, but you add all that together, and we're we're in the driver's seat for the week. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. I'm being realistic here and expecting this level of a loss. And this is how we're going to try to mitigate that and, you know, work our way back into the game. But back to the scanner, we've got DLTR. Let's finish out the exercise because we've got a couple more sitting here. DLTR, which is Dollar Tree. And that is, you know, it was gapped down massively on the last earnings. And guess what happened? Last time they gapped down. I don't know what happened necessarily around here, but they gapped back up pretty quickly. But it looks like that was on earnings. Uh, but this $138 level, I don't know if I love that level, especially in the context of talking about things returning to their pre-COVID highs. Pre-COVID highs, I mean, they were right around like the 115 level. And you can't find a ton of premium anywhere near there, right? You're only getting about 1% at the money for Dollar Tree. You know, that <laughs> that doesn't seem quite right, you know? You, you think a dollar, you know, even at the money is $2 of cushion enough to, you know, potentially protect against what we saw with them last week let me i'm pretty sure this is earnings driven let's take a look yeah huge drop from 170 back down here but even even on friday right this thing went from 150 down to 138 that's a 12 dollars move and again at the money they only want to give you a two dollar cushion i'm not a fan of what's going on with dollar tree right there let's keep moving down the list uh gsk GlaxoSmithKline. i believe we played this one a couple weeks ago and it was one of my favorite little trade ideas that we came up with on the stream because they just ran into some lawsuit issues uh, the same way that 3M did. Now, we were able to get comfortable that you know this wasn't the end of the world for them. We identified a little level of support, and it bounced off there nicely, because again, it was down in that blue on the RSI. We played the bounce off the lows of RSI, uh, and we were guided into the promised land on that one. Now, this one's gotten a little bit lower since then, down to 33. Let's, let's just take a peek and see what it's offering for next week. Uh, I, don't, I don't like... Uh, this is... <laughs> I should say not anywhere near big enough of a cushion. Yes, there's you know over 1% ROR on these technically out of the money, but look, uh, when this thing finishes at 33.19 and 33 is technically out of the money because it's 19 cents out of the money, this isn't anywhere near enough for me. We got a question saying, do we pay for data? And we do not currently uh, pay for any data. I think everything that we need to properly execute our strategy, uh, you know, we have right here, we have the tools at our disposal. We have our scanners, right? Uh, we could pop over to our Discord server really quickly. We have some tools in the Discord server as well that I think are very, very helpful. And it's loading off screen. Give me like two seconds to pull it in. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Some really exciting air for you guys right here. Uh, but we have tools in our Discord server as well, right? Not only do we have the scans that we could look at, uh, we could look at the Discord server where we have some IV reversion alerts where things like Bed Bath & Beyond, tickers like EYES get alerted to us. So we could take advantage of big moves during the week. We also have alerts anytime a stock with options gets halted and anytime it resumes so that one, we're ready to identify the opportunity when the stock gets halted and two, uh, we're alerted and ready to act when it comes back online. And I think these opportunities as well are very, very helpful on a week to week basis because one thing that we've started counting, or I guess tallying up is how much money are we making on new trades in the market, right? A couple weeks ago, 650 bucks. $1,600 the week before that, $1,300 the week before that. There's so much action during the week. And the one thing that I cannot emphasize enough is that a week in the market long-term isn't a lot of time, but a week in the market on a day-to-day -day basis is a very long time. You know, we don't, we don't want to exhaust all of the buying power that we have on Monday morning because one of the lessons that we want to keep in the back of our mind are that things can always get worse in the market. Right when you think, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm drawing the line right here. I'm going full tilt. I'm putting all my account into this stock at this price level. Things can always get worse, and that is a lesson that unfortunately is learned more often than not by experience. Which is why, you know, I think it is helpful every now and then to have a big loss. We don't want big losses, but I think we learn the most from big losses. And the most positive, beneficial adjustments that we've made to our strategy have come off the heels of big losses and have shaped it into what it is. But even though we've had sustained success against the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, it was not without a couple of speed bumps, right? You look back at the end of 2020, we had a very big loss that took us from a 50% gain to, to a loss overall. Now, by the end of the year, we were able to recover. So in early 21, we, we crossed back over the indices that we used to benchmark our performance. 
Uh, we also have another big one at the beginning of 2022 that we talked about a little bit earlier in the skirt in the stream. Uh, but since then, you know, we've adjusted the strategy again. And yes, we had another big slide, which kind of coincided with an overall larger market slide. And that kind of stuff just happens. Uh, but we know that when things at least flatten out or rebound, our account can rebound nicely based off the strategy that we've adapted to and put into play. Uh, let's see, we've got a question about if uh, Dollar Tree eclipsed its open uh, option interest. And I think that's in relation to the question we had about if we pay for data. I do not know the answer to that one. So there's a lot we know here and a lot we like to teach and talk about, but I will. the last thing I will do here is talk out of my ass about and pretend to know something I don't know. So I do not know the answer to that question, unfortunately. Uh, but with that said, here's what we got. And again, things can always get worse. If there's one takeaway that I can give you this week, it's that yes, last week sucked. The two weeks, I mean, a week before it, the week before that rather sucked as well. I mean, it's taken 5% out of the market in a two week period. That is not a small amount. However, things can always get worse. We look at futures. Things are on their way to potentially get worse. Well, we hope that we could close this out for 3.5, but we may need to go up to like four or something like that and lose an additional 300 bucks on that trade. But if it happens, it happens. However, what we can do is take what's happened, use the cash, stay you know conservative, and be smart about where we put our money in. We've identified some of these opportunities on the stream tonight up front. You know, these opportunities between one closing this, rolling it into the other, and then, you know, looking at these four different stocks that we took a look at tonight, that's $1,505 alone of profit. Now, we know that the way that we've been managing our portfolio lately, it starts with the small list at the beginning of the week. Last week was a little bit lighter, but then we add a ton of different new positions during the week to get us to our ultimate goal, which is, you know, making money and getting to our ultimate profit. And a lot of the money that we make during the week comes from these newer trades, right? There's a lot, excuse me, there's a lot of purple on these lists that we uh, that we pull in. So yes, it's great to have a plan going in Monday morning, but we say this at the end of every single stream because I think it's so, so important. You could absolutely get punched in the face and by noon on Monday, your entire plan, you know, you could basically tear up the sheet of paper that you wrote that down on. Uh, but with that said, the most important thing that you could have in a volatile market is cash and then two the patience to know when to use that cash. Scaling into positions, very, very important. Yes, we have these long positions, but every single stock that we have on here, uh, we are able to double our position size. And that is because we started more conservatively. So when this market dropped 4%, we didn't get crushed. Yes, some of these positions went into the red, but the idea is we roll them down, we roll them out, we slightly increase position size. And even if the market does a rebound, even if it just tr trades flat or slightly red, as we've illustrated earlier on the stream, a lot of these positions individually will make money. And if our individual positions get to positions of profit, we're going to make a lot of money and do very well in the long term, right? If we don't lose, we win. Very simply put, uh, but kind of a big idea behind trying to manage and win every one of these individual trades, you know, the way we have with Bed Bath & Beyond, even the way we did with UVXY when it moved against us, right? Uh, we had an initial loss right there. You know, you just roll the position. You could roll it same week for a larger credit. Uh, you know, you could roll it down and out to a different strike, etc. right? And you could just turn these small losses into small wins and small wins compound on each other, right? We load the bases with a bunch of singles, then we drive all the runs in uh, when we finally have the stocks move in our direction. We've got me here in the YouTube chat checking in. What's going on, man? Uh, but it's about hour and 15 into the stream. Here is our plan for the week. We've discussed it. If you are late to the stream, haven't watched the stream, or if you're watching the stream on YouTube, uh, you know, thanks for making it to the end. Uh, you can watch the replay on YouTube. That's where all of the replays are posted. But this is what we got, right? We're coming off the heels of a very, very nice winning streak. We've won eight weeks in a row with profit that totals up to $28,000. Yes, we still got a little bit of uh, work to do to get back to break even on the year, but we're confident that we're going to get there. We've had some very, very strong outperformances of the market lately. Uh, our performance since inception is the, con you know, this is kind of the proof of concept that we have and why we are so confident that we're going to be able to get our account back to where we need to. Uh, but stay patient. Keep an eye on the Discord server because there's, you know, I imagine there's going to be a lot going on during the week, right? We just dropped basically 4% last week and the futures are already down 1%. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of excitement intro week. Uh, but until next time, and maybe this is why the market was jinxed. It's because I didn't. Uh, it's because I didn't say this last week because we didn't. Because uh, we didn't stream. But until next time, uh, this has been the Hourglass Trader, where as time passes, we make money. Thank you guys for tuning in, and hopefully we talk again same time next week. 
uh, with more money in our account than we have right now, right? If we could just turn this number green by the end of the week, the mission is accomplished despite the volatility in the market. Let's just focus on keeping our heads above the water during tough times. Uh, but again, thank you guys so, so much who have been tuning in. We'll be in the Discord server all week. And uh, that's all we got. See you guys next time.